Hey everybody, Brother Scott McCarran again. I, uh, you know, the U.S. has been having a lot of demonstrations and fights with the police recently, and I'm not really going to talk about that. I want to talk about my interaction with the police, if it's interesting. Some of it's funny, some of it's not. Um, I thought that, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of interaction with the police. And then I started sitting down about doing this, and I came up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times I've interacted with the police. So, apparently I've had a lot more interaction than I thought I did. Um, so I'm just going to go through them just to share. It's about me, what it's like for me getting interacting with the police and everything. I don't know that the fact that I'm white and blonde haired and blue eyed pertains or not, but I'll put that out there. Um, anyway, first one, looking in the window. When I was like 12, 13 years old, I kind of thought I was unattractive, fat, nobody wanted me. Probably because my mom told me that. Or I became convinced of it, and a lot of things happened. And I was 12 or 13, and all sorts of misunderstandings happened then, so who can be sure? But there was this girl I was interested in. First time, you know, really thinking about doing something about it. But, I, you know... I was 13, I didn't want to, like, tell her that I liked her, because, you know, that would be far too embarrassing and shy. One night I was walking home, and um, walking through the woods that went between her house and the house where I lived, and I looked over and the light was on in her window, and in my 13-year-old brain I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity to get to meet her, and I'll just stand out here and eventually she'll come in the room and see me and she'll open the window and say hi. And, um, you know, I don't have to sit there and tell her I like her. I can just sort of connect with her. So I started doing this and after several minutes I heard this loud twig crack and I turned and her father was walking toward me in the dark and it suddenly dawned on me. I was a young male looking in his daughter's window. And uh, I got that that was a problem really quickly. And so I ran as fast as my 13-year-old legs could go, which were faster than his. Um, and I got away. Problem is, is my dad was an army officer, and I lived on an army base. And army bases are surrounded by a fence with barbed wire on top. So I couldn't get out of the army base. Not like I could go anywhere anywhere. I was 13. So for about a half an hour, I ran around the Army base with military police cars chasing around. And finally, I came storming out of the woods, and there was an MP standing there with his 45 caliber pistol pulled out, pointed right at me, and he told me to stop. So I stopped, and he came over and grabbed me dragged me over to his car and threw me down the hood and stuck his 45 right on top of my head and told me not to move, motherfucker. Now, you know, the difference between what the two of us were perceiving. He'd been told there was this guy peeping in girls' windows. There was this young pervert. I was like, oh, this is the first time I ever told, tried to tell a girl I liked her, and now I'm sitting here with my head about to get blown off. Completely different understandings, except he had a Colt 45. So, you know, I was terrified. And they handcuffed me and took me in the car to the police station. And there my dad showed up. My dad had, like, gotten a call from the police. And my mother was wondering what was up. And he told her, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. He comes over. The investigator's like, trying to get me to admit it was there. And, of course, I don't want to admit that I was, like, interested in a girl, so I'm making a police evasive explanations. 
And finally, my dad said, come on, Doug, we all know you're lying. And I was like, you know, in my head, like, thanks, Dad. And then uh, my family was admitted with me, and the police turned me over to my dad, and he said, can you tell me what's going on? And I just stared out the window. And then we drove home and uh, came in the front door, and my mom's, like, wondering what the hell's going on, and why were the police involved, and what had I done? And Dad said, you know, don't worry about it, I got it handled, and she's freaking out. And my dad took me to her room and said, no matter what happens, don't tell the women. It was a very common theme with my dad. Um, something would be wrong. He'd tell me, but he didn't want the women to get nervous. So don't tell the women. Of course, the women can tell we know something and we're not telling them, which makes them really nervous. Anyway, so, you know, that was my first experience in love was to have a forty-five caliber stuck to my head which added to my feelings of not being wanted and unloved. So, you know, for the first several times I actually went on on dates with women in college, I always had this impression on my forehead that I remembered. So that was my first encounter with the police. Um, let's see, the next one. Oh, yeah, ID cards. So I was at high school, and in the military you get these identification cards so the various authorities can tell who you are if they ever want to talk to you. And um, there's this one guy I knew talking to, but I never knew his name. We, didn't, we like were aware of each other. We talked, but we never said, hi, I'm so-and-so. So we decided to tell each other who we were. And we gave each other our name. And then I can't remember which one of us. So one of us said, how, how do we know this? So we showed each other our ID cards. And he handed me his back, and I took mine, and as a joke, I took both of them and put them in my pocket, and then I laughed and handed it back to him. And we're laughing, and all of a sudden this woman walks by, and she says, I know what you two are doing. I'm calling CID. And she walks off on this huff, and looking back at us and wagging her finger at us. Now, CID is Criminal Investigation Department. It's the police. So this guy I'm talking to is uh, well, saying, well, you know, Doug, we need to get out of here. We don't want CID coming by. And I'm standing there, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. I'll just stay here. And he's like, okay. So he runs off. And so, you know, I miss my next class. I'm standing there for about half an hour, 40 minutes waiting. And he comes back after class. And he says, are you still here? You know, this is dumb. And he says, uh-oh. And I turn around. And there's like three police cars full of military police, actually air police. That was, this was on an Air Force base. They pull up and about 12 cops get out and they come walking over to me. And about this time, the high school is changing classes. And the junior high school across the street is changing classes. So they're all looking over at me and the cops are asking me to, like, you know, empty my pockets and stuff because I don't know why. But, you know, I dropped down, like, this, my pencils and pens. And I had this, like, big square piece of gum eraser with all the label off. And I threw it down there, and they grabbed it in midair. And they said, what is that? And they said, this, I said, uh, that's a gum eraser, sir. And he says, that looks like hash. And I was like, what's that? because I'd never smoked anything. Because I'm the son of a lieutenant colonel. It was very much drilled into me that what I did reflected on dad. So I didn't do stuff like that. And about this time, the junior high kids come over, because junior high kids are fearless, and start screaming at the cops and, you know, yelling pigs off campus. The high school kids were a little more, you know, back, but they're like, you know, all upset too. This is, this is like during the Vietnam War, so the police were, of course, the enemy. So the police uh, decided it's a good idea to get us out of there. And I looked over at uh, my friend. I'm going to leave him unnamed because who knows what impact this will have on down the road. Um, and they said, do you know him? And I said, well, he's the guy I was trading cards with. You know, we were just giving each other our names. So they immediately walk over and grab him, and he says, thanks, Doug. 
throw us in separate police cars and we drive away, all 12 police and us. And we drive down. I want you to know, this is a real story, I'm telling you. Um, drive down to the post exchange at the shopping mall. We drive into the back area, which is all fenced in. There's barbed wire on the top. And they get us out. And then about five minutes later, three more police cars show up. Two guys with scoped rifles get out and run up to the roofs and are aiming them out into the tree line. And I'm like, you know, I'm sitting there going, for a couple of ID cards? And I'm like, what is going on? And I said, don't worry. You know, the police say, be quiet. The police are coming. And I'm, I say, well, aren't you the police? And they get glared at me and told me to shut up. And then you start hearing that there's a couple of German shepherds in the place. They start barking. And the gate opens up again. And a couple of German police come in, like another five or six police. So now you got about, I don't know, what, the original 12 and another eight Americans. So that's 20 and then five or six Germans. So there's 26 police officers with their German shepherds and everyone's armed to the teeth. And there's two guys up on the roof with uh, scoped rifles. Again, this is a real story. I uh, am looking up at this thinking, well, this is like uh, mighty odd. And so he says, why did you have this hash? And I said, that's not hash. That's a, that's a gum eraser. He says, yeah, yeah, we're going to have it examined. So they put it in a baggie and put it off to the side. And I started focusing on my friend. And like, you know, oh, so you again. And I kind of pick up that, well, he'd had interactions with the police before. You know, we, they say, like, we really should have got you the first time. He says, I don't know what you're talking about, officer. And then the German police come walking up to me and they say, you know, what is your name? Douglas Scott McCarran. Are you an American citizen? Yes, sir, I am. Do you live on the base? I said, I'm a military dependent, but I live off base in a, in a apartment building. My dad, he's a colonel in the U.S. Army. He's actually posted in Heidelberg, but my uh, mom committed suicide several months ago like four or five months ago. And so he arranged to have me live there so I could finish out my high school with the same kids that I knew. And he went to work down there. I said, uh-huh. So you live with your dad? And I said, no, I live alone. I live on a, the top floor in a penthouse, which was true. <laughs> and he lives in Heidelberg. I, we're here in Mainz or Wiesbaden, actually, across the river. And they go, oh, so you're a unchaperoned young male American foreigner in our country. And I'm like, yeah, that's me who's selling drugs. And I was like, selling drugs? What are you talking about? That's it's a gum eraser. I said, we don't like it when the police lie. I said, I'm not lying, officer. I said, uh-huh. So what is the address of this apartment building? And, uh, you know, I was honest. I said, I don't know the address. I just go there. I got, you know, I said, well, you know, you cross this highway and you come over here and you take the bus and it pulls up here and you get out and then you walk up and you go upstairs and I live up there, but I don't know the address because, you know, I've never had to know the address. I'm like, and a smart ass foreign American. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know what to say here. So they talk to us a little while and then they break it all up and, uh, they all drive away and we get in the cop cars and I, we, me and the guy I was with, we get escorted back up to the highway or the high school in different cars. And I'm like, as I'm getting, I, was, I say to the officers, what was this all about? And he says, you know, I'm like, no, I don't. He says, yeah. Uh -huh. And I drive away. Then I start walking into the high school where word is spread that Douglas was uh, arrested by the police, which immediately gives me all sorts of street cred, I guess. So I walk in there and all the like students are like high fiving me. I'm old and fat and think nobody loves me. And nobody talks to me, which is pretty much happening. And suddenly I'm walking out of the hall and everybody's high fiving my hands. And I was like becoming really like aware of, you know, the police had projected something on me. That woman had projected something on me. The students were projecting something on me. That principal was glaring at me and projecting something on me. And it was just amazing to see how all these presumptions 
we're uh, turning into this big, massive mess. And uh, all I did was ask the guy's name and show my card. So uh, I don't entirely know what was going on there. Um, later on, about a week later, Dad's home. He's, you know, shaving in the morning. And we get a phone call. And I answer the phone and say, hello, Douglas McCarran. I can't remember the guy's name. He said, hello, this is Sergeant Sohn's show from CID. May I talk to your father, please? And I'm like, uh-huh. And I put my hand over the mouthpiece and I go, hey, uh, Dad, Criminal Investigation Department wants to talk to you about me. And, of course, he sticks his head out like, what? Washes his face out and he comes out and I tell him what happened. And I don't know. I think they thought I was dealing drugs, but I didn't. And he said, are you sure you didn't? And I was really offended that he wouldn't believe me. But I said, no, I didn't, Dad. So he takes the phone, he talks to them, and I go to my room and I start to sulk. And sulked for years about this because it was just further proof my dad didn't trust me. Um, about a month later, there was this group of uh, kids that decided to go out of the high school, get drunk, and they stole some beer from a German worker he tried to stop him, and they smacked him over the head with his uh, bunch of beer bottles. And then he, they came back to this school and were, like, shoving people around. He was, like, you know, 16, 17-year-olds. And uh, causing a lot of mayhem. The American police show up to grab them. Of course, the junior high kids come over, you know, yelling about pigs off campus again. Very, very excitable. There's this semi-riot because the police are trying to get them. And then the German police showed up. The thing is, these kids had gone off of American base into the German economy, German city, which meant the crime happened on German territory. And they're grabbing these kids and hustle them, and students are running up to them and, like, two feet away, like trying to slug at the police and the police pull their guns and point them at the crowd of teenagers and tell them to, in German, back the fuck off. Of course, you know, typical American 12, 13 year olds, they don't know German. All of my friends are like stepping forward going, pigs off campus. Me, I go running for a car and dive over the edge because I want to hide behind the car if any bullets start flying. And I look over and, uh, this crowd of several hundred students is coming in and the Germans and the American police are backing up and they grab these kids and they slam them into the van and then throw them in the back. And in the middle of all this, the two guys who drove me back up to the high school, the two officers dragged me back up there, I bump into them and I go, hi, you know, it's kind of a mess, what's going on here? And they go, uh-huh, and I said, I said, so can you tell me what that was all about? And he says, well, we know you're one of the biggest drug dealers in the high school, and we thought we caught you. And my response was, which is true, sir, I haven't even drank in a beer. I don't do, deal drugs. And their response was, uh-huh, sure, buddy. And they got in the car and drove off. So, you know, here we are. I had never really done anything, and I was the prime suspect of being a drug dealer in the high school. I... You know, the closest thing I'd ever had to hash was that rubber eraser. But there I was, chief suspect. Now these kids got deported, which means they uh, were taken to Frankfurt am Main Airport. Each one stuck on a different airplane, and wherever that plane landed, that's where they were. 16, 17 year old kids landing in an airport in America with nobody to get a hold of them or pick them up. That's what deportation is. And to tie the story out, many years later, 10, 15 years later, I was talking to my dad about this. And, you know, I told him everything that happened. He's like, oh, he's, 
you know, he's really surprised. And I said, you know, and it was really hard for me because I uh, took that as a sign you never believed me. And he kind of looked at me and he said, well, what you apparently don't know is the commanding officer of the base that the high school was on wanted to deport you, as in get thrown on a planning and live, land anywhere and get thrown out in the public. And I said, my son told me he didn't deal any drugs. And the Air Force officer said, well, we're pretty sure he did. And my dad said, okay, I'm going to go talk to the commanding officer of all American troops in Europe. And you and I are going to go talk to him about what's going on. And you have no proof my son did anything. And one of the two of us is going to be out of a job by the end of the afternoon. Do you really want to go there? And the Air Force officer, because he had no proof that I dealt drugs, backed off. So the interesting there was my whole assumption, my dad didn't trust me, my dad didn't support me, my dad didn't care for me. And the truth was, he had risked his entire career for me simply because I told him I didn't. Me projecting on him, police projecting on me, woman projecting on who knows what. So it's like really hard, you know. And I watch all this stuff that's going on in America and people are getting shot and beat up and, you know, you don't know that, you know, all these officers are projecting stuff and the fear of the person getting arrested, they're projecting back. And it's just like people just, need, you know, very obvious. People need to be aware they're projecting their fears on one another and they need to remain calm. You know, I know, I mean... I didn't particularly enjoy the idea that I got hauled away in a police car, but, you know, especially the thing with the scoped rifle, rifles over that. Apparently, that's how big a drug dealer is supposed to be. They had scoped rifles trained on the trees because you know, I'm just making this up. I don't know. I don't know what they thought. I think that's the most important thing. You don't know what is going on in the other person's head. So, you know, restraint. My dad once said something to me about the police that I've always stood by. He said, I don't know that the laws that are passed are um, good laws. They're somewhat biased. You know, we came out of the 60s. My dad told me this. We came out of the 60s, and a lot of the police job was to suppress black people. And they were just starting to, like, stop that. But the one thing you always need to remember is whatever the laws are and however just or unjust they are, <clears throat> the cops got a gun. So it's best to just be calm and comply. And, you know, don't argue with them. That's what I did. And I don't know if that applies to anybody else. Maybe it is because I'm blonde-haired, blue-eyed. Except, you know, I was the number one drug dealer in the high school, so they probably didn't care. They didn't know my dad was a lieutenant colonel. So that wasn't it. So I don't, I don't know what to say. I just know every time I meet an officer, I keep very much in mind that he's got a gun. He's probably concerned that I have one, except I never carry one, so it's okay. Uh, next thing, let's see. Um... In the middle of all this, the thing that was funny, or ironic, was because I was very standoffish and lonely, I used to hang out with the military police on the base I lived in before my mom's suicide. And they were the ones I chuckled with and laughed with the whole time, which is kind of, you know, interesting, considering you're not supposed to hang out at military police shacks. But they liked me, and they thought I was friendly, and I was friendly, and you know, when I found my mom's body after she killed herself, they were the ones that showed up and gave me a hug before my dad got home. So, just very interesting interactions. Um, later in college, <laughs> this was a kind of an ironic one, 
So I eventually did get into smoking pot because everybody in college was, not everybody, but large proportion of people were smoking and taking things. And um, they didn't have marijuana in Germany, they smoked hash. So I bought some to smoke it. I was very circumspect and quiet because I lived in a little Gast house, which is people rent out the upper, Germans rent out the upper floors of their houses to foreign students to make money. And I had one room and the guy in the other room was a guy from Turkey, who as far as he was concerned, all people who take drugs are the same level and they should all be killed. So I didn't share any of my uh, drug experiences with them, which at the time weren't a lot, but they grew. Part, part of being sad and lonely was I did get into the, the drug side of things just simply because it uh, was different and felt better. I'll talk about that someday. Um, so anyway, I'm walking home. It's February. February is kind of cold. Um, I usually took the trolley home and then a bus. It's very late though. The trolley got to within about several miles of where I live, but the buses had stopped. So I'm walking seven miles in February and minus freezing, below freezing weather. I got gloves on and in my left hand, I got this little tiny thing of hash in there. I have a, back over, a bag over my back I'm walking along with because I'm in school and I got my books in there and I'm walking along and this German police officer officer's car pulls up and th two German police get out and stick their flashlights in my eyes and they're speaking to me in German. And I didn't know a lot of German, but I, I, I said, ich bin nicht Deutsch, which was very simple German for I am not German. And then I said, ich bin ein Amerikaner, which is very simple, I am an American. And, you know, typical of Europeans, they all know more than one language. They started speaking to me in English. So they asked to see inside my bag. And I'm sitting, you know, this thing of hash in my gloves, freaking out. But keeping calm, I hand it to them, they open the bag up and they shine it in there and they look around and I say, okay, here's the bag back. We're sorry, we got a report somebody stole a radio out of a car and you're walking around the bag, so we thought it might be you. What are you doing? And I said, well, you know, I got off the trolley and the bus stopped, so I'm walking home. And I said, oh, do you need a lift? <laughs> I'm sitting here with this thing of hash in my hand. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do. So I get in the back of the police car and they drive me three or four miles to the front door of my house. And I say, thank you very much, officers. And they drive away and I walk up. And then it was also hard to get in because the lock was so cold. It was hard to turn the lock. But I finally got that up and went upstairs. And there was my Turkish friend who was like watching television. And um, he said, anything ha interesting happened? You know, this guy who equates all drug dealers with being put to death. And I'm like, uh, no, no, not really. And I looked at him. It was very, uh, just really interesting for me because he's sitting here staring at his television, just completely mesmerized while talking to me. And I'm like, oh, you think drug heads are the ones who are like uh, captured, mesmerized, eh? And I walk into my house, room. Everybody projecting on each other. Oh yeah, the gravestone. So later on when I lived in, uh, what the heck was that, Michigan, I uh, took LSD. And it has a very exhilarating, peaceful, free sensation to it, unless you get really bad LSD, in which case it's horrible. But for my I suck, nobody loves me mindset, it was a nice thing. I'd taken it off and on over years. But at this particular time, I bought about 30 hits because I needed two, but I had friends who wanted more. So I, I warehoused the thing. And, you know, hopefully I don't get thrown in jail. That's 45 years ago, so hopefully it's okay. But... I'm, my friend suddenly didn't want it. So, and I'm getting phone calls from people that I don't know asking if I have any for sale. And I'm like, no, no, I don't. 
you know, it was this. So I'm sitting here with all this stuff. And I come home from school one day. It's the middle of summer. And I'm in shorts and wearing, like, really flimsy shoes and a T-shirt. And there's a bunch of cops standing around out in front of my house. And I'm like, oh, my God. You know, I can't go in the house or they'll arrest me. So I just walk on by, freaking out that, you know, all, you know, all I got on is the clothes on my back and no money. I'm going to starve to death. And then ah! I walk around for about a half hour and I come back and they're still there, but they're in the next yard. And apparently what had happened was somebody had stolen a gravestone from some cemetery and dropped it in the yard next door and they'd come to pick it up. I don't know why the police were called to get that, but that's what had happened. So they were just in my yard looking around to see if there was anything else, I guess. And they drove away and I went in my house and uh, took a hit of LSD and poured the other 49 down the toilet. <laughs> so I was out that money. Uh, that really freaked me out. I didn't, it's probably close to the day I stopped taking drugs because... That was a little too close for me. Uh, what else we got here? Oh, yeah. But before that, there was one night where I was standing outside and kind of a fall evening, kind of cool and brisk. And I'm, you know, high on LSD and I'm staring up in the stars. I don't know if you've ever, for those of you who haven't taken LSD, it's very focused. And when you look at the stars, it is just astonishing to look at them. So I'm sitting there looking up there, and it's like almost like you're flying among the stars is the feeling. It's just incredible. And this car pulls up, and I look down, and it's a police officer. And he looks at me, and he says, are you all right? And I said, yes. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm high on two hits of LSD, officer. And he's like, oh, really? So he comes out, and he says, can you tell me about it? And I was like, Sure. So we sit in his car, and I tell him about what it's like to get on LSD, and he's, like, kind of fascinated by it. And then, uh, you know, I told him how you get down from it, which, if you don't know, I don't know if this works for other drugs, but LSD in particular, if you're really high and you want to get down, or you know somebody who's really high and you want to get them down, or you're a medical professional, give them an orange and get them away from fluorescent lights because... LSD, you know, you may have heard there's a shimmer. The reason is, is our eyes are constantly being jiggled by little muscles. That's what we can see three-dimensionally. On LSD, you can pick up all those jiggles and things just sort of jitter around. You stick in that fluorescent light, which is strobing, and it gets really painful. So, nice incandescent light bulb and an orange. The orange does two things. It kicks in your digestive tract, which increases serotonin, which is one of the main things that get stopped when you take LSD and starts the whole trip. Serotonin from eating starts shutting it down. And the citric taste, the, the citric acid, cuts through the numbness that you feel on LSD and just kind of startles you back into your body. And you'll be down in about 20 minutes, half an hour. I just say that because I know friends who were like taken to emergency rooms and stabbed and tied down, just all sorts of things that just freak them out. And it's a lot easier just to hand them an orange. You have to eat, eat a bite of it so the person knows it's safe to eat it. But that's my suggestion. Anyway, you know, you know, so I'm talking to the officer. I tell him the whole thing. He says, okay, it's very informative. I get out of the car and I go out and stand on the sidewalk and start looking up there again. And he drives away. Uh, and then the last time that I know of that I interacted with the police, who knows, maybe they're following me, mm -hmm. uh, is in uh, Southern California, and I'm driving along, and it's about 3 in the morning, so I'm kind of sleepy, and I'm a little, a little weedy. So a police officer pulls me over, and he thinks I'm drunk. And there's something about the way I look. Apparently, I have this affect. I don't know if it's showing up now, where I look like I might be drunk. And apparently, yeah, I'm sure you want to know this. Apparently, I smell like beer a lot. 
I don't know. I don't smell it. Um, so he's like sitting there going, you know, how many fingers am I holding up? One, you know, touch your nose. So I reach out and he says, no, no, do it this way. And he gives the specific instruction. I'm doing it. And I'll walk a straight line. I said, well, that may be harder because my left leg's a quarter of an inch shorter than my right. And a lot of times I fall over. And he says, don't give me that crap. So I'm like walking very slow. But it's true. I have a heel lift. So he did this whole thing and he came to the conclusion I wasn't drunk. And he uh, let me go. You know, I got out of it. And it's, it's very kind of weird because it's like they suppose that I'm drunk because of the weaving. And they're projecting that on me and that's not good. But then one time I was driving, riding with my uncle, who was an alcoholic, and he would get drunk and down the road. And the police pulled him over and asked me if I could drive, and I was only 16, so I said no. So I said, well, you know, you've only got two blocks to get home, do it. It's still, I mean, we're driving down a highway at 15 miles an hour, and he's like, uh. So I can see why the police want to pull over drunks, because they're a danger to themselves and everyone around them. But it's just weird when I don't drink and I don't take drugs, you know, I haven't taken drugs in 35 years, and I <laughs> apparently I occurred curse semi-drunk to people. Anyway, so never got arrested, only had one gun put to my head. Um, that combined with the whole feeling I was unloved and then my mom's suicide had a big impact on, you know, when I was in college and didn't date a lot because mixture of, you know, unworthiness, unloved, and a 45 on my forehead. Um, but it is just that whole, and then I keep hearing about these instances where People assume somebody's doing something and then they call the police and then the police assume something else is happening and then it just escalates and suddenly someone's dead. You know? I just, to everyone, you know, just be a little more cautious about what you're judging other people to do. That's all I can say. I don't have any real answers. I'm just sharing this. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll see you at the next share. Bye.